following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. OIC offers a variety of resources to those interested in learning more about options, including live seminars, webcasts, and podcasts. Check out www.optionseducation.org for more information. Now here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education, Joe Burgoyne. Welcome to OIC's Why World of Options. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Let's get started with industry happenings. It's time to get a handle on the latest developments from the world of options. It's time for industry happenings. One of the new developments in the industry, brand new, are these mini options. Well, you may say, what's a mini? Minis are options that offer the buyer or seller a contract that ties up 10 of the underlying shares as opposed to 100. So that's why they're called minis. It's a pilot program that started with just a few stocks. You know, it's it's very young. It's a pilot program that has just started and one that uh, will be interesting to see how popular uh, these products do become. Again, one contract corresponds to 10 shares of the underlying, not like the standard contract, which corresponds to 100 shares of the underlying. Uh, one distinguishing factor between the minis versus the standard options, uh, when you're looking at these things on your platforms, after the underlying symbol, uh, that symbol will be followed by the number seven before the option symbol. So that's important to realize uh, so you can differentiate between a standard option versus, you know, these mini options. A couple more things about the minis. They are American-style options. So just like the standard options, they can be exercised or assigned at any time. And I guess the last thing maybe I'll mention is uh, because they are one-tenth the size of the under of the standard contract. Let's take our an example of a five dollar option. If we were to buy or sell a five dollar standard option, we'd be either putting out or collecting five hundred dollars. The mini option, that five dollar option, will be uh, valued at fifty dollars, one tenth of the standard contract. So uh, that's the latest development from the industry. It's our pilot program of the minis, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how successful this pilot is going forward. It's time to break down the latest option strategies. It's time for Strategy Spotlight. I'd like to welcome Bill Ryan, Managing Director from New York Stock Exchange, ARCA, who's going to join us today to talk about the topic of selling puts. Bill, good morning. 
Good morning, Joe. How are you? I'm great. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, tell, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your experiences in the options industry. Well, first, let me say thanks for having me, Joe. It's, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I started in the option business in 1982, and if anybody remembers, there was a company at the time uh, named D.F. Hutton, and that's where I started. So I've been in the option business since 1982, and I've spent the majority of my career working on the retail side of the business. And what I mean by that is I've always worked with brokers and customers developing option strategies and helping the customers and the brokers uh, to, to pick the right strategy for the right situation in different stocks and index options over the years. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's a uh, quite a long history there, which is dynamite. And we'll uh, draw upon some of those experiences, I think, over the next 15 or 20 minutes. Now, um, how about uh, the group that you work with at New York Stock Exchange, ARCA? Uh, you want to tell a little bit about your specialties there and what the gang does? Sure. Well, I work with two different groups. I work with the, the options part of the business, and that includes uh, both the ARCA side and the Amex side. And we work to develop different market strategies, work with market structure, pricing, uh, anything that, that – um, reflects in the options world itself. And we also talk to all of our customers, and by our customers I mean broker dealers and liquidity providers and, and, and anybody that interacts in our marketplace at all. I also work with the relationship management team, which is a group of people who deal with all different aspects of the New York Stock Exchange. That's the, the options side, the futures side, and the equity side. So I see a little bit of both, you know, of all different parts of, of the business. Now, you know, you work at the New York Stock Exchange. Do you get goosebumps still every time you get down onto the floor? Well, I'll tell you, it, it gets, you know, it's not so much the goosebumps anymore, but I do enjoy bringing people to the floor and have the opportunity to look at them and see how much they enjoy the floor. But it's still a very exciting place to be. It really is. Uh, I think I'm in the latter camp. I'm, I'm still a goosebump guy when I get an opportunity to get down on the floor. Well, uh, how about, uh, you know, we, we spoke before the show and, and, and you talked about being interested in speaking to our listeners about the whole idea of selling puts as an option strategy. You, you want to tell our listeners why you chose that strategy? Sure. Joe, I think it's a great strategy. It, there's two different outcomes uh, when you sell puts, and one of them would be that you buy a stock, and the other would be that you generate income. So it's it's one strategy that can have two good results to it. I think that's, that's the strategy that's most appealing to a lot of people. And it's also a strategy that over the years, large corporations have used, and I, I'm reluctant to mention any names because I'm not sure that they're doing it any longer, but there were several large companies that had put selling programs in place in order to buy stock back for the stock buyback program. So I think it's an exciting strategy. It can be used in many different places, and it serves two different needs. Well, let's, uh, let's get into that a little bit. You talk about uh, two outcomes buying stock or generating income. You want to elaborate? Well, sure. But before we get into into the end results, let me just hit the risk first. I'd like to cover the risk right up front so, so listeners understand what they're getting into. And the risk with selling put short is that you end up owning stock. Now, that doesn't sound horrible. Uh, you, know, you end up owning the stock. But you can end up owning stock in a down market, and that might not be so good. So just remember when you think about uh, selling puts that you can end up owning stock in a down market. And the risk really with a short put is the purchase of the stock. So let me give you an, an example of how this can work as far as uh, buying the stock is concerned. We'll start there. And it's, it, think about this as, you know, for a customer that might enter a GTC order, a good till canceled order. So hold off the GTC for a second. Let me explain the selling puts and then we'll go back and compare the two. When you sell a put, you have an obligation to buy the stock at the strike price. So if you sell, for example, a 30 strike price put and you bring in $2 in premium, if you end up assigned that expiration, you would have an effective buying price for the stock of $28. That's the 30 strike price minus the $2 premium that you bring in. So you could end up buying stock at a price of $28 under that situation. Now, if the stock doesn't move in the direction that you want and the option ends up expiring worthless, you keep the $2 premium. So in effect, you're paid $2, that $2 premium, for waiting to buy the stock. I think that's a great deal. With a GTC order, you can't do that. You put your GTC order in below the market, you wait for the stock to come down. If it comes down to your level, you buy the stock. 
If it doesn't come down to that level, you never end up owning this, buying the stock, and your your GTC or somewhere along the line will expire. And as I said, with the short put, you get paid. That premium is is you being paid to wait to buy the stock. Well, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, is there a secret to picking? In in your example, you use the thirty dollars strike. How do our listeners go about picking a strike that is suitable? Well, that's going to depend on your outlook on the stock and what your purchase price, what your your good purchase price is, where you're happy owning that stock. So if you're happy owning the stock at the $30 level, you could sell the $30 put. You wouldn't sell the $35 put because then you're going to be put at $35. So the strike price you pick minus that premium has to be the price that you are comfortable and happy with when you buy that stock. So there's okay. a balancing act in there. You know, now that what, the example you described, if the stock didn't go your way, you know, I guess you're talking about if it wasn't in the money, that put in the money at expiration where you acquire the stock, you, you just you keep the income. What about, you know, having this strategy where you just really want to acquire the stock? Is there any different approach? I uh, know you you might look at the strike price a little a little differently then and maybe you would buy and I'm sorry sell an in the money put because that would give you a greater possibility of being assigned that expiration and you buy that stock. Okay, how about if let's let's just run through uh let's say we got a $43 stock and we're looking to sell the put ideally to acquire the stock, but obviously if the stock goes up um you know, we're going to collect the income. What strike would you suggest on a $43 stock? Okay, so our stock is trading at 43 And let's look and see if we really wanted to buy the stock. We might look at the 45 because the 45 put is in the money. If we sell that 45 put and the stock stays where it is at 43 we're going to be assigned and we're going to buy the stock. Now, the 45 put being in the money with the stock trading at 43 would have at least a $2 premium and probably maybe more like a $3 premium. So if we sold the 45 put for $3, that gives us an effective buying price on the stock of $42. That's a dollar below the, with the price where the stock is right now. Okay. So if you're looking to really truly have to buy that stock, you're really looking at an at-the-money put or an in-the-money put. And then how about you know, which month to sell? How, how do you go about choosing that? Is there well, you know, you know, a, a secret? <laughs> you know, Joe, time is always a difficult thing because you have to have uh, – an idea in your mind of price and time when you're in the options world. And if you look at something for a month, you could say, okay, a month might be enough time, but there might be an event coming up that you know of. And that event might affect the price of that option and the price of the stock. So you have to be wary of what's going on out there. This, is there an earnings announcement coming up? And will that earnings announcement affect the price of the stock? And if it does, say the earnings come out and they're bad, pushes the stock down, maybe that's what you want because then you'll be able to buy that stock a little bit cheaper. So you have to be aware of what's going on there. Time is a very difficult thing. I would hate to, to, to uh, pigeonhole it into, say, like a month or two months, something like that. I think you need to time, you pick your put around a time of an event, something that you think is going to happen. And as always, I tell people, you know, you're better off with more time than you are with less time. Okay, fair enough. Now, um, when we talk about selling puts, I hear a couple different terms that are out there. I hear uh, cash secured puts. I hear selling puts naked. What's what's the difference between the two? Okay, well, let's start with cash secured because that that's the most conservative of the two. A cash secured put simply means that you have enough cash in the account to pay for the stock should you be assigned. Now, let's take our example of a $45 strike price. Uh, the standard option with the 100 multiplier, that would mean you need $4,500 in your account to cover the purchase of the stock should you be assigned. So having that $4,500 in the account when you sell the 45 put would be considered a cash-secured put. If you don't have that $4,500 in the account, that's a naked put. Now, your brokerage house is going to require some margin here because they have to protect themselves and you, the customer, against some risk. So you'll have to put some margin in the account, but you won't have the whole $4,500 in there, and that would be your naked put. Okay, so uh, the relationship that um, you know the investor has with their broker is going to be rather important when it comes to selling these naked puts? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve sets margin requirements. The stock exchanges set margin requirements. And the brokerage houses have the ability to have margin requirements and have greater margin requirements than either the Fed or or a stock exchange. So the brokerage house requirement may be different than anybody else's. So if you do this cash secured puts, you really have to, I mean, uh, naked puts, you really have to check with your broker and find out what that margin requirement is. All right, Dynamite, good to know. Let's, you know, we've we've got our put orders out in the marketplace where we, we sell some short puts. Uh, how does an investor manage, you know, a position like that if it's going against them? Well, you know, before anybody enters into an option position, you really need to have an idea of what to do if and when. Uh, um, it's really not a good idea to get into an option position and not have a plan if the stock goes against you. I always tell people to think of how much money you can afford to lose and your pain tolerance. How much are you really, really going to be able to afford to lose? So if you have $5,000 of um, capital at risk and you lose 1000 of it, is that too much? Is that just right? So when it comes to the short puts, if the stock is dropping and you're going to be assigned, that may be a good thing because you expect to buy the stock and you want to buy the stock. But if it keeps dropping further and further and further, you have to think to yourself, you know, I first thought the stock was going to hit a level and of support and then go back up, but it seems to have broken through the support level. Now I have to rethink. And if I think it's going to continue to go down, I have to adjust. So can I, I can adjust by buying back that put and ending my obligation. I would lose a little bit of money, but sometimes you're better off taking that loss early on. You know, and this Wall Street's loaded with a lot of old sayings, Joe, and one of the ones that I remember best was your first loss is your best loss. So sometimes if that's if you're losing a little bit of money, buy back that put, end it, and move on to something else. Good advice. How about uh, Delta? You know, one of the Greeks. Is Delta a factor when you're you know deciding which put you may want to sell? Well, you can look at the delta, but the first thing I always look at when I tell people about selling puts is I look at the premium. And make sure the premium that you receive brings your purchase price down to the level where you're comfortable buying the stock and also covers your commissions. Now, we throw some numbers around here. We never mention commissions, but commissions are very important, and they figure into you know, the profit and loss of any option position. So you have to know what your commission level is. But first, I look at the premium. Make sure that brings the stock down to the level I'm comfortable with. Make sure I cover my commissions, and make sure it's a good income if I don't buy the stock. So basically, really, rather than focusing on the delta, your advice is to, to look at that time premium to really uh, key in on that stock level. Right. I look at the premium first, but and then I go to delta. Joe, we mentioned delta. I go to the delta after that. The delta is going to tell me the chance of me being or the probability of me being assigned at expiration. So if it's a higher delta, the chance of me being assigned is greater. So if my goal is to buy the stock, I want the higher delta option because I have a greater possibility of being in the money at expiration. If I'm looking to generate income, I might look for a lower delta option with a less possibility of being in the money at expiration. The lower delta option is going to be a less premium than the higher delta option. So again, it becomes that balancing act. From an implied volatility standpoint, again, another one of the Greeks, uh, you're, you're mentioning this time frame. Do you target implied volatility levels? Well, I look at them, and where I use the implied volatility level is to tell me if my thinking is correct. If that implied volatility level is very high, it might be an indication that something is going to happen. And maybe I'm not aware of what's going to happen, and that's going to change my outlook on the stock. Now, remember, Joe, we've talked about this in the past. Higher volatility levels equal higher premiums. Lower volatility levels are lower premiums. Higher volatility levels are more risk. Lower volatility levels are less risk. So look at that volatility level and see if it looks okay. And by look okay, I mean look at some historic data and see if it's about the same level. If it's much higher than, than historic levels, take a look. Take a step back, take a look, and find out why that level is so high. And, and from a, uh, an expiration point of view for the underlying, is there an optimal price target that we're looking for for the underlying to be at expiration? Well, again, that depends on your goal. So the optimum level for the stock to be at expiration would be – below the strike price if you're trying to generate income and above the strike tr strike price if you'd like to buy the stock. So it really depends on what you're looking to do when you sell those puts. 
Fair enough. It sounds like this strategy, like many option strategies, there are a lot of different components, a little bit of art, some science that go into making the right trade or investment. Fair to say? It's fair to say. And as, as always with every option strategy, the stock is still the key here. If you're wrong on the stock, what the stock is going to do, the options are not going to work out the way you would like them to work out. Any uh, any other little nuances you think uh, our listeners may benefit from? Well, the one caution I would I would give to everybody who's listening is if you sell puts to generate income, don't get caught up in the leverage. Do not over leverage yourself. Only sell enough as many puts as stock you're willing and able to own, because what happens is people get in in a habit. They sell a put, you know, they keep, it expires worthless. They keep the premium. Do it again. Do it again. And all of a sudden, they increase their size from five to ten, and from ten to twenty. And before you know it, they become over leveraged. And if they're over leveraged and they get put the stock that they can't afford to own, they give back all the profits they made before. So. Use, use selling, put selling for, for income generation cautiously. Make sure you do not over leverage and only sell as many puts as stock you want to own. Well, that's, uh, I think that's an awful good note to kind of wrap up our conversation on put selling. Before we you know, close it down, as you mentioned at the start, you know, you've been in the business for quite some time. Any fun stories uh, from the industry you'd like to uh, offer to our listeners? Yeah, Joe, I have I have one in particular that I like to tell, and I tell the story. And when we work on a trading desk, we had a lot of fun with the story, but it's it's part cautionary. You know, it involves it, it makes you know that you have to understand the strategy that you enter, enter into. Years back, it had to be in the probably in the. Um, mid 90s, I was working on a trading desk and we had a customer call us up and tell us that he wanted to do a spread for a two and a half spread. And I asked him, I said, is that a debit spread or a credit spread? And he said to me, don't you know? And I said, well, yes, I do know, but I don't know that you know. Now, if you, you know, Joe, <laughs> being in this business a long time, if you do the debit spread when you're supposed to do the credit spread or vice versa, you're going to have nothing but trouble. So we always told that story. We told that story to many people, and it's just a kind of a cautionary tale to make sure you understand the strategy that you're getting into before you get into that strategy. Good stuff, Bill. Well, um, I do want to uh, really thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Um, I hope that our listeners uh, have a little better, actually uh, a much better understanding of of some of the risks and benefits associated with the put selling strategy so uh hope to see you out out on the road before too long bill joe i enjoyed being here and, and hope to see you soon it's time to meet the movers and shakers from the world of options it's time for profiles and perspectives joining us today on profiles and perspectives is jill malandrino of the street Jill runs the Options Profit Program at the Street and wears lots of hats over there as well. Hello, Jill. Hi. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm uh, doing very well. I hope you are, too. Yeah, we certainly are. Lots going on in the markets these days. There's always something to talk about. Yeah, there there always is. And, you know, you lead the charge, I think, with energy level for the industry, and uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the street. What's going on? Sure. So the street's a very interesting segment that we're in. Um, not only do we have the financial media aspect of it, which is all of the offerings that you'll get on our flagship site, thestreet.com, which is where we house our journalists, we're broken into another segment, which is called premium services. And that is where you'll see all of our actively traded newsletters um, and products that we offer. Uh, in addition to Jim Kramer's Charitable Trust, which is co-managed with Stephanie Link, that's the Action Alerts uh, plus profile. We have uh, stocks under 10 breakout stocks. We just recently launched Dividend Stock Advisor, which has had a, a tremendous reception. Um, we have our Real Money and Real Money Pro products. And then, of course, we have Options Profits, which is the product that I manage. And that's everything that you need to know at the street regarding options, futures, and commodities. Well, uh, you're wearing a lot of hats there, Jill. How, how did you land up at the street? So what I essentially do for the product, um, in addition to managing what you see every day online, I also do a lot of market site reporting from the NASDAQ and I report from the CME and the SIBO. You can find a lot of my content in addition to OP and the street on Yahoo Finance, Fidelity, um, the NASDAQ, SIBO, 
websites and, of course, different financial blogs. Um, in addition to that, because education is such a huge commodity, particularly in the option space right now, we are also teaching three to four strategy webinars a month, quarterly classes in conjunction with the SIBO and with Option Pit. Well, that, that really sounds uh, compelling. And uh, as you said, it, it's all about education. I mean, that's really what drives you at the site. Fair to say? Yep. Yep, that is completely fair to say. And in addition to um, the educational component of it, one of the first things that we pioneered at the street was developing a very unique community on it. It is the most interactive service that we offer here um, where you have the ability to communicate and share trade ideas have them help you walk through adjustments and exits through the comments platform that we've developed on options profits. So not only are we giving you the ideas, we're walking you through the trades. We're taking it's over 300 years of combined trading experience and bringing it to the home gamer, the retail investor, and all the way up through your buy side derivative strategist. So there's something for everyone on there um, from our more basic webinars that we offer on a month to month basis all the way through our more complex volatility trading classes that we offer in conjunction with the SIBO. So there's something for everybody there. And we encourage um, not only for our um, options profits contributors to be interactive, but really for our readers that participate on the site to share their ideas and to get some feedback. So it's not just um, an education site and um, a source that will tell you when to get in and out of a trade, but it really is a very unique community that we've developed. There, there really is, uh, I, I think, no better educator than people who are in the space sharing ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, battle tested, uh, mm -hmm. big wins, big losses are oftentimes, uh, you know, the best educator. How, how long has the street been around? Uh, we've been around for about 15 years, but this product in particular, we've been around for about, oh, wow, almost going on three years. I, I took over the product in June 2010, and what we've accomplished in the past three years has been one of the most um, impressive stories that you'll hear across the industry. Um, not not only just from growing it from a subscription standpoint, but again, the whole community that we've developed. Um, it's it's almost like a, its own social media product in itself, like a Twitter or a Facebook. The community is so intertwined that there's groups of people that have actually flown in from all different parts of the country and have met and have really developed relationships and friendships beyond that. So it's it's a trading lifestyle more than anything else. Because as you know, Joe, and it's not something that we just do for the sake of having a job and going to work every day. This is something that you're totally passionate about. You live and breathe the markets. It's just what we do. And we've developed that community to, to share that with people who may not have traded on the floor or on a trading desk. So that that passion, you know, is uh, prevalent with with a lot of us who are who are out there uh, talking to folks day in day out, and and it's wonderful to uh, to have those, you know, moments where you see when you're talking to investors, you know, the, the ah, I got it moment, and mm -hmm. I, I know you create a lot of them for people in the industry, which is is dynamite. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. I mean, think about one of your favorite Foxhole buddies. You tr you traded with Skip, right? What's the thing he says all the time? Oh, that epiphany moment. And that is what we see day in and day out um, with the people that have been on the site with us for three years now. We've seen them have those moments like a year, year and a half ago. Then I see people who signed on last summer where they're sort of doing that. So we've really established that pattern where you could see people come full circle as they trade the cycle, the four quarterly cycles through the markets and so forth. Um, and the great thing is about trading options in particular, because the model is so different than um, the equity model, as the markets evolve, us as market participants constantly have to evolve and adjust our trading styles, in particular, this environment that we're trading in right now, and with all the new products that are coming out. I mean, think about it. When you started in the industry, you and Skip, there were no puts. Now look at all the products that you have now it's to, to the most complex, you know, volatility-based offerings that are out there. So it's something that is consistently changing. It, it, there, there is, you don't do the same thing every day. And that's why I think it's particularly exciting, especially for younger people coming into the industry, because questions I get asked a lot are, um, in fact, we hear this all the time on the panels that I've spoken on with you for the OIC. Is there any opportunity? It's not like you can just walk onto the trading floor or the trading desk anymore. And I think more so than ever, particularly if you have, um, if you're very entrepreneurial, because all the resources that are available online and all the mentoring and the tutoring, um, we didn't have that when we started. We literally walked on a desk and you just figured it out. 
So I think the opportunity exists now more so than it ever did. Well, um, you know, that's an interesting perspective because obviously uh, the the industry, uh, like any vibrant industry, is changing dramatically at light speed. Uh, you know, the old trading floors obviously don't really exist anymore. Um, right. But at the same time, I like your perspective uh, that there is lots of opportunity. And I think all that anybody has to do is is be aware of the underlying option volume growth in the industry over the last 40 years. And it, it really supports your point that there is lots and lots of opportunity. Sure. And um, we've seen, you hear this every day, how there's you know, no volume on the exchange. We went from trading 1.3 billion shares a day to maybe half a billion, 600 billion day in and day out now. But look at where all of the volume has shifted to. It shifted to, to the options market. And you're even starting to see more participants focus on futures as well, which I think is interesting. But look at what just launched um, this Monday, many options, which brings the home gamer a little bit more into the game, if you will. Those are the options that trade on one-tenth of a standard size, so you can trade odd lots with this. So I think it almost takes the scariness of options out of it, and it'll help people learn how to use the same strategies that the pros use on the standard sizes, but it just doesn't seem as scary because it's not quite as big, but you still have the opportunity to lever up like the pros do, to hedge, and more properly manage your portfolio. So it's not just it being an opportunistic time to get into the industry, but I also think from the retail trader perspective, the tools out there and the fact that you see these minis out there and the resources and help and education are available, there is no better time for a level playing field than there is right now. And and the access to the markets, you know, has never been better. I mean, look at the success of the weekly products over the last few years. I mean, uh, you know, we are an industry that continues to evolve. Um, last thing, um, any fun story you want to tell our listeners before we wrap it up? Oh, boy. <laughs> any fun stories to try to think. Actually, what we need to do is get Skip on the program and have you guys tell the funny stories. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I would say more so um, – than funny stories. I think I just want to be as relatable to the audience as I can. And again, one thing that I've noticed that I've, I've sat across uh, on multiple panels, whether I've been panelists or moderated across the country for whether it's you guys or the NASDAQ or I've done this for NYU, every single thing that you hear, every participant says, it's about having passion for the business. This isn't something where you just turn on your machine from 9 to 9.30 to 4 every day. This is what you live and breathe. And I think if you can really um, understand that first before walking with the notion that you're going to make money, you're going to kill the market, that's how you're going to be long-term successful in this game. It's the only way to be, is to be consistent and disciplined. And that is why you will be sitting here 20 years from now like I have or 40 years like some of us that we know and still having this conversation. Well, there you go. Jill, beautifully put. I want to thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you out on the road. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. It's time for a nostalgia break. It's time to take a look back. Now it's time for our looking back segment in today's show. In 1975, the OCC was approved as the Central Clearing Corporation by the SEC. Also in 75, the American Stock Exchange and the Philadelphia Stock Exchange began trading options and became members of the OCC. The following year, in 1976, the Pacific Exchange started trading and also became an OCC member. It was actually in 1977, and I haven't mentioned this you know, in the past, but going back to the inception of the industry in 73, those 16 contracts that traded on the SIBO, they only had calls. There were no puts when the industry started. It wasn't until 1977 when the SEC allowed for puts to begin trading in the options industry. And that's our Looking Back segment for today. It's time to upgrade your options toolbox with cutting-edge trading platforms, devices, and information. It's time for tools, resources, and good reads. On tools, resources, and good reads today, we want to leave you with an old-time indicator. How about the TRIN, better known as the Arms Index? It's an indicator that goes back to 1967 
when it was founded by Richard Arms. To give you a sense for what this indicator is about, it's, it's really a straightforward indicator. I always found it uh, was pretty good, not, not so much for picking tops and bottoms, but giving you a sense for you know, the market being overbought and oversold. And exactly what the trend or arms index is, it's the advancing issues divided by the declining issues. That's divided by advancing volume divided by declining volume. So the way it works, you know, you come up, you take those four components, you come up with a number. The idea is that when that number is above one, you know, it's bearish. And when the number's below one, you know, it's bullish. Friends of mine on the floor back in the day, you know, we used to uh, kind of spread out that one number. So below 80, we'd look for a market or 0 0.880. We'd look for a market to be oversold. And above 1.2, we'd look for a market to maybe be overbought. So that's the trend index. And the author I'd like to leave you with today is none other than Shelley Natenberg, who uh, you know wrote an option book called Options, Volatility, and Pricing. And I would urge you, it's one of the, the real uh, foundation books in the options business. You may want to check, uh, check out Shelley Natenberg. That wraps it up for today. Next time, we'll be joined by Alex Jacobson in our Strategy Spotlight. Alex is with Options Express, and he'll be talking about credit spreads and really getting into some depth about the credit spread strategies. We'll also take a short walk down memory lane with a chat about the 40th anniversary in the options business. And to wrap things up, we'll be joined by Mark Longo of the Options Insider. Thanks for listening today. And I hope you'll join us again next time for OIC's Wide World of Options. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore edu or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening and be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.